the way I think about it is a goal is something that I'm striving for, I hope happens. It's kind of like I'm, you know, I, I want this to be the case. The vision for me is it is going to happen. If you heard the story about Jim Carrey, how he wrote himself a $10 million check while he was a struggling artist, his first big job, Dumb and Dumber, he got a $10 million check. So I've thought about that for a long time and I've wanted to do it. And this morning I did this perfect timing for this. You know, you and I have such great synchronicity in our lives together. I wrote a $1 million check to myself for three years out. And in the, in the memo line, it says to take pursuit to the next level. I get happiness and enjoyment out of doing things for people to try to make them feel good. So I don't need that, that, that dollar or that investment to have any ROI or be worth anything financially because it's worth so much to me emotionally and spiritually. And I think there's a place for that in the financial plan. Welcome to Two Quants and a Financial Planner, where we bridge the worlds of investing and financial planning to help investors achieve their long-term goals. Join Matt Ziegler, Jack Forehand, and me, Justin Carbonell, as we cover a wide range of investing and planning topics that impact all of us and discuss how we can apply them in the real world to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. Welcome to this offshoot episode here on the Excess Returns channel on YouTube. Like, subscribe, all the things. We're introducing a new idea, and I'm really, really excited to have my friend Justin Castelli here today for this. Justin, say hello. Matt, thanks for letting me come join you, man. Um, our last episode on my podcast was a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to part two of what will be infinite episodes we do over our, our careers. We're just going to be like those artists who yeah. trade mixtapes back and forth forever, right? <laughs> this is how this is going to go? It, yeah, it could be. <laughs> I'm open to it. So we're calling this new segment or this new show really inside the channel here, The Intentional Investor where purpose meets portfolio. And what's really important and interesting about this is Jack and Justin have been doing the show us your portfolio episodes, mm -hmm. which are really cool ways to see how professional investors, allocators are doing stuff for themselves, not just for their clients. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating. But as a planner, you and I both, there's so much life that makes up a life's portfolio, a life's work. Mm -hmm that we deal with helping clients align for every single day. And I kept saying to Jack and Justin, I'd watch these episodes and go, guys, this is amazing how they're doing this for themselves. But I want to ask them all these other questions about how they put their business together and think about how this works with their family. Mm -hmm. And I think nobody else better to kick this off with than having this conversation with you. I'm, I'm humbled, man. Seriously, to, to be the first one to come on and for you to think of me in that, in that guard, I think that's awesome. All right. So for people who don't know, my guest here, <laughs> Justin Costelli, is joining me. Uh, founder RLS Wealth, founder the AGC, that's the Advisor Growth Community. Professional advisors, if you don't know that, if you're solo RIA or something, check them out. I mean, they wrote a book together. That's mm -hmm. all you need to know. It's on that shelf back there. It's outstanding. He's got his uh, creative collective, Pursuit, PRST. I, I have this wonderful swag on today, uh, straight, straight from the factory. Uh, your wife, and she's got a store. What's it called? Is it called Silas, Silas, Silas? Did I get the name right? Uh, it, it could be. No, it's Roman and Leo. There's no <laughs> Silas in it. And I know that you did that as a joke. Yeah. So my firm was RL Wealth Management when I first launched it. I rebranded when Silas was born. Ange did not because her store had a much bigger <laughs> footprint when it came to social media and things of that sort. So she decided she was not going to rebrand the store. It'd be too hard. But what she did do is create a line for Silas. So she learned how to manufacture her own t-shirts because she's very particular about the fit that she likes for little boys. And there was a brand that was doing it. They quit doing it. So she learned how to manufacture. So she has her own, you know, custom t-shirt she has made. And then they are branded with Silas by Roman and Leo. We are coming back to all this, but this is, that's your preview right there. What's this, this show about? It's about when we're constructing our life's portfolio and you leave the third kid out who you didn't know was going to be part of the equation, you end up adjusting the name of your flagship business. Exactly. You get it right. uh, you've also got Life Design Plus, this whole new endeavor. 
You've got the daily notes, which you can sign up and read, justincastelli.io. You can sign up, get them on a mailing list, get them in your inbox, do what I do, read, and then send Justin little love notes every single morning. <laughs> You've got all the Live Your Authentic Life stuff. You know that I love that. Rick Rubin, we can go on for days. And you are a financial advisor, mm -hmm. but you're not just a financial advisor. You're not just an investor. You're so much more. So welcome to the show. Let's start here. Financial advice, we talk about goals and your portfolio and we put big old air quotes around all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You personally, just you, but mm -hmm. in context of your family, how do, you, how do you think about goals? Does that word even mean anything to you anymore? I think more about goals for the boys as more than I do for myself. I, mean, I, I guess I do have goals, but I think of it more as my goals are more visions. And huh. I don't think of them as goals as I want to achieve these things. For me, it's I'm going to achieve these things. So I don't look at it from the lens of a goal. But I want the boys to set goals and work towards it. But I hope that I can help them through you know, all of the content they hear me creating and talking about at home. I hope that I can transition them more to a vision rather than a goal sooner in life than, than I realized it. Is um, it? Is the goal just because you can see the finish line, you can see the goal line and the vision is like that much more than just this one finite task? The way I think about it is a goal is something that I'm striving for, I hope happens. It's kind of like I'm, you know, I, I want this to be the case. The vision for me is it is going to happen. Oh. And I have kind of gotten to the point where not out of arrogance, but the things that I would, the things I would have in the past called a goal, I don't choose that unless it's something I know that I'm going to be going towards and then it's going to happen. Um, and I don't know if that really makes sense. In my mind, it makes sense. Um, but it's just a shift in kind of perspective as uh, to me, the vision is I know this is going to happen. Now, it might manifest in a slightly different way. You know, we talk about, you mentioned pursuit the collective. Like that started out as one thing, it's evolved. That will, that will be a thing in the future. The funny thing is I did this today. Um, if you heard the story about Jim Carrey, how he wrote himself a $10 million check while he was a struggling artist, his first big job, dumb and dumber, he got a $10 million check. So I've thought about that for a long time and I've wanted to do it. And then this morning I did this perfect timing for this. You know, you and I have such great synchronicity in our lives together. I wrote a $1 million check to myself for three years out. And in the, in the memo line, it says to take pursuit to the next level. So pursuit, the creative collective today really is just, I produce my podcast, I produce my videos. So I'm calling them pursuit podcast, pursuit um, productions. Eventually I'll bring back the hoodies and the hats. There'll be a lifestyle brand with it, but I don't know exactly how that's going to manifest out, but pursuit will be a, a brand that people will know. It will have meaning. It will tie to this concept of authentic life. But in my mind, the vision today has a record label with it, a production company, you know, think along the lines of PG Lang and what Kendrick's doing. This would be my version of that. There's no doubt that pursuit is going to be something bigger. I have a vision for it. It's not a goal because it's not something I want to happen. It's going to, but I don't know exactly what it will be in three years and then beyond that. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I think about the vision. We have to clarify this point. This is the problem with you and us, you and me having a conversation in public. So wait, uh, Jim Carrey, I forgot about this story. He writes himself the $10 million check, right? Yeah. And so in the memo line, it says for services rendered acting. Oh, fantastic. And now, his first major check was $10 million. And you can go check it. Like I first read about it in, um, I think Quantum Warrior is the name of the book. I forget the guy's name, but okay. this guy knows Jim Carrey. And that story, and it's floated around. And I heard somebody misquote it lately and said it was 20 million, but everything I found said 10 million. But yeah, so th the point of that story and in that book is, you know, manifestation and what you put out there can happen. And, but nonetheless, so I'm carrying around now in my wallet, it's dated for the future. So you can't cash it today. If you jump me a, a $1 million check to myself to take the pursuit brand to the next level in three years. I never thought I would tell anybody that. Well, here it's only on YouTube. I mean, <laughs> let's let's be honest. Who's we're not? I'm not in this orange sweatshirt because you know before this I jumped Justin. The, <laughs> I have to contrast this. Do you know the Ricky Henderson million dollar check story from when he played for the Oakland days? No. I I can't believe I've never thought of these two stories next to each other. I'm so excited for this right now. 
So Ricky Henderson gets a, I think it's a signing bonus mm -hmm. for the Oakland A's of a million dollars. And it's his first big payout because it's, geez, I don't know, must have been like, I don't know, 80s, maybe early 90s, whenever. So he gets this million dollar check. What do you think he does with this check? Because he's so excited. He can't believe he has a check with, you know, all those commas. What do you think he does with it? Uh, um, I don't know. I, I want to say he spends it, but what's he do? Yeah, that's what you would think, right? No, Ricky Henderson literally frames the check and puts it on his wall. <laughs> Before cashing it, right? He didn't wait to get the check back. <laughs> exactly. So like a month or two goes by, uh, maybe not that long, but like enough time goes by that the A's finance department is like the books don't balance what's going on. And they slowly figure out that they wrote this check to Ricky Henderson for a million bucks and he hasn't cashed it yet. And they actually have to go to him and be like, you can photocopy it. But please catch the check. That's we awesome. have to run our business. That's awesome. I did something similar with the first paid speaking gig. But now you know, fast forward to 2023. I took a I did a mobile check deposit. So I have the actual check. It's already been deposited, and I have it to be framed as my first paid speaking check. That's that's amazing too. But Ricky's story is a lot funnier. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ricky's story and Jim Carrey's story next to each other represent an amazing combination of manifesting a, a really a vision, mm -hmm. you know, and even if it's beyond the scope, like in Ricky's sense, it's beyond the scope of the initial vision that this thing happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to canonize that this thing happened. The manifestation version of it, where you're putting it out there and kind of daring the universe to, to cash the check, so mm -hmm. to speak, is they're kind of two sides of the same coin. That's, mm -hmm. it's really a fantastic, I'm so happy you brought that up. So let's, Talk to me, this goals and vision thing, really, you've, you've got me swimming on this one. So when you think about RLS Wealth, when you think mm -hmm. about the AGC, when you think about uh, pursuit and all this stuff, do you think about, do each of them have a level of goals and a level of visions? To be honest, I've never really thought about it. I've never approached RLS Wealth and trying to grow it to hit a certain level. Um, whether that be number of clients, revenue, assets under management, I've just always set out that I want to take care of the people I'm working with. I want to find more people that I enjoy working with and everything will take care of itself. So for being a numbers guy, when it comes to like growth goals and those things, I don't pay any, any attention to it. And that's been my whole way through my whole career at other stops along the way. You know, I was at a four or three B company and we had goals. I never paid attention to the goals. I always exceeded them, but I just said, I want to do what's right for my clients and everything will take care of itself. So, um, I mean, I think that, I think there are goals for RLS Wealth and for the AGC, but they are more qualitative than they are quantitative. So like I have a goal that RLS Wealth, you know, never loses a client because they're unhappy. I hope that I have a goal that my clients continue to embrace my evolution as a person, as an advisor, and don't leave me because what I'm wanting to do going forward is not what we started out doing together. And the way I make sure that doesn't happen is I keep working with them the way we always have. So I do think there are goals from that standpoint that when you initially asked it, I thought of a goal of, I want to make a certain amount of money, or I want to have a certain number of clients. Like that would be a goal in the past I would have had. I think my goals now are more qualitative things. Um, and I think part of that is, I think, I believe things will grow to where they're supposed to be. So to have a goal for the AGC to have a certain number of advisors in the community, I don't want a certain number of advisors. I want the right number of advisors who care about each other and make the community great. Because I could have a goal of double the numbers we have today, and maybe the community suffers, but I met my goal of numbers. Um, I'd rather have it be the right number of advisors that make the community such a special place that it's always been. And if that's more, great. If it's not, fine. But the goal is I want the community to be tight and be meaningful and help people and then help the profession. So a goal or a vision can be either qualitative or quantitative. I'm going to say that first. Is that yeah. a fair thing to say? Yeah. And you've got me swimming now. Like, I, I don't think I'm doing a good job. I, like, I internally know the difference. I just think that for me, vision is convicted and it's going to happen. So therefore, it's not a goal. For me, a goal is something I would like to have happen, but if it doesn't, and you know, I'm, and, and maybe I'm approaching it a little bit differently. Um, so they're very, very close. I guess I don't think I'm doing a good job finding the right words to explain the difference. 
I, I think you've done a very adequate job of explaining the difference to be very fair and diplomatic about this for being put on the spot with this type of stuff. This is fascinating to me. And I think this is really interesting of mid journey entrepreneurs, creators, people who have started something, experienced some success, but aren't yet at the end of the thing where they're ready to convert it into something else, whether that's a sale, a succession plan, whatever else. And I'm going to tie all this together in a second with it, but this like mid journey experience of seeing this evolve. And I think what's really cool about this is you actually decided to reject a bunch of stuff that pulls forward, like the end, I'm using the word goal, but like mm -hmm. the end goal in the sense of I'm trying to hit this revenue metric for RLS wealth, mm -hmm. or I'm trying to meet this member number target so that I can, you know, sell more memberships or something like that mm -hmm. for the AGC. You've actually said the thing that matters for a service community is the community. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a like a mid journey realization. You probably didn't, did it feel like this coming into it? And did you expect to be in this place where it was all about service? When, when did that happen? Um, I think I've always had a servant's like mind and heart, but I don't think I ever really thought about it. That's one of the things like, that's why I, I meant, I joked in our lat in our podcast, how like being around someone like yourself, who's well-researched, well-read makes me a little nervous and uncomfortable. Because I'm, such, <laughs> I'm such an emotional, I'm, I'm led by emotions. So I don't need a lot of evidence to make me believe something that I feel. And the reason I say that is I just have always gone the direction that felt right. And it's always been serving other people, putting other people first. And I think I've observed that from like my parents. Um, you know, my dad is really selfless to a fault. And I've talked about it before on other podcasts and things, but like, I remember going i remember the car and everything i don't have like a really great memory of growing up but i remember this in this episode we were going to get a new car a honda accord forget what year it was but i remember the color it was like this greenish teal that was really popular in that year so we're at the car dealership we're doing all the paperwork to get it and the salesman comes back and this wasn't a like a, a tactic because we already said we were going to buy it and said that there was somebody else who wanted to buy the same car and my dad looks across the, the showroom floor and recognizes the guy. And it's a guy that worked at his um, employer and he had just gotten back from being deployed. So my dad said, he can have the car. Um, but we wanted it, we were excited for it, but because of what that guy sacrificed, my dad just walked, and you know, cars aren't important, but just the fact that we were that close to buying the car that we wanted. And because my dad saw this other gentleman and knew what he had just come back from, he was like, nope, let's, let's let them have it. Um, so I just remember examples like that, that have led me that way. I remember reading the go giver a long time ago. And as I read that book, I was just like, well, yeah, this is obvious stuff. Like people need to read this to learn this. Like this just makes total sense. So I think serving's always been in me. I think that if I look at how I approach my career and getting to where I'm at, because I was never numbers focused and income focused and, and really goal focused more about taking care of people and let the chips fall where they may that spoke to it. Now that all being said. I may have, I may have stunted my growth. I may be, I could be in a different situation had I focused on the numbers, um, because in some belief systems, the more concrete and you know exact you are with what you want, dates, numbers, times, helps you get there. So you know, I don't know what I'm holding myself back from. Maybe you know, think about my podcast. Maybe I give a bigger audience if I would have set a goal to have a million downloads on my podcast in a year. But that just doesn't feel authentic to me. So I, I don't do those numbers. I just want to do what I think is right and put it out there and then let it fall where it's supposed to fall. I'm going to ask you about client work in a second and how mm -hmm. this flows through. But I'm fascinated by this idea. When, when we put on our financial planner hats, it all comes down to consumption or gifts. Mm -hmm. So any asset that you build, you look at that calendar, you look at the cash flows. Oh, I have a surplus. I'm going to save an asset somewhere. Mm -hmm. Extra cash flow becomes something. It goes in the 401k, goes in the savings account, goes into the family business. But the idea is at some point, if nothing else, because we die, because we expire as humans, mm -hmm. that's either going to be consumed, converted back into some cash flow, or it's going to be gifted to some next generation. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to talk about a version of, I know you love the expression, the messy middle, but there's this version of it 
where you don't know. If I tell you, if I ask you right now, you don't know if this is supposed to be consumed or gifted or just part of the the water in which you wade into life with. Mm -hmm. Like that's what these things feel like right now. They're they're providing meaning to your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you help clients think think about like you're advising other people? Mm -hmm. If Justin Costelli, the advisor, was advising Justin Costelli, the business owner here, would that advice change at all? To myself, I don't think it would because my approach would be really getting to the person's why. So, you know, what are, going back to goals, like what, what, what are your goals? Um, and, and, you know, are those visions, are those goals? But to clients, and I, I think I view them differently than most people. So getting to what their goals are, understanding the why, and then I want to start challenging people more to figure out, well, are those really your goals? And if not, then whose are they and do you want them and not? And I think that through that process of questioning this, the status quo and belief systems, that may help us determine better if it should be consumed or saved or whatever it might be. Um, I, I have a feeling a lot of people have gone through life I won't say autopilot and without purpose, but I think they've gone through life without questioning a lot. Now, you, I, you and I, I think are different, but I think just looking at the clients I've worked with over the years at all of the companies and people that I talk to and friends that I talk to, like they're not unhappy, but I just also don't think they've questioned why are they doing what they're doing? Why do they live where they are? They just went, they just started down this path and it was a good path. It's not bad. So they've never had any reason to, to think outside of it. Um, and obviously there's people who are going down a path that they absolutely hate and they should be questioning it. But the people who are comfortable, uh, my dad and I had to talk about this on a, a podcast episode yesterday about, about being comfortable. Um, comfortable is not a bad thing, but I don't ever want to get comfortable because then I think I stop growing and I want to continue to grow, not grow for growth's sake, but just grow to keep on experiencing new things and learning and seeing what comes next. It's really interesting. And I think this is a really, really important message from this conversation. This some of the stuff I really hope keeps coming out of these. The why can be beyond consumption or a gift. That's the mm -hmm. very traditional financial planning. Why mm -hmm. are you going to spend it? Did you put the 401k money in there because you're going to spend it when you retire? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to convert it to a Roth and gift it to your kids tax free? That's all fine. That's well and good. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that the why can be beyond consumption or gift. You're actually saying the why can be experiential. And even though that's not a great financial planning answer, mm -hmm. that's a really good life answer. Mm -hmm. Which brings up, should the financial plan be a financial answer or a life answer? Like, what's the point of the financial plan? That's why I'm no longer, like, I don't view myself or call myself a financial advisor. I will always be one. Um, but that's why I've moved to life planning. And like, I, I want to be a life planner slash advisor because I will give advice and money will come into it. But I don't think that the plan should be governed by spreadsheets or the CFP curriculum. I think those should be a part of the plan, but I think the directing force should be the life of the individual or the family. And then you bring the numbers in the spreadsheets to align with that. And obviously, there's situations where the life that the person wants, the numbers don't support it. And now you've got to kind of make some changes. But I think if you focus numbers first, then people go down that comfortable path or the path that, you know, society has told them they're supposed to go down and they never get to really experience the life that they were meant to live. And I think we were all created to, to do certain things. If you can get somebody really to tap in, this is where my a love of spirit, mind and body come in. Tap into who they really are deep down at their core. Listen to their heart. Follow their passions. I think that starts to begin to reveal the life that they were created to live and the one that's going to bring maximum happiness and the things where everything just falls into place because they're aligned. If you can focus and find that, then I think you bring the numbers to it. And I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth. Before you do all that, I think it's important to do a basic plan and make sure all of the fundamental things are covered. I don't want to go dive into a deep life plan and create this great life knowing my clients don't have the right insurance coverages. They need disability insurance. They don't have an emergency fund. Like Making sure those foundations are there and maybe even so far as going to say, let's make sure that you are on a good trajectory for society's 
life plan, retire at 65, you know, all those things, or maybe there's some goals, make sure you're on a good path, or at least we know where you are. So we know that you're, you're heading the right direction. You're doing all of the right things according to curriculum and spreadsheets so that if we get this life plan semi wrong, you're, you're still on a good path. And then once we know you have the foundations in, you're able to manage your, your money properly and you have a good long-term plan in place, let's go dive into the life that you really want. And we've had this conversation in my life planning. I'm in the mentorship program right now of Kinder's um, RLP designation. And we had this, we've had this multiple times talking about, well, I'm not quite sure that everybody is ready for this. And Louie, shout out to Louie, our, our main instructor, he said, everybody would be open to it. You don't have to tell them that. You just have to ask the right questions and be empathetic and give them space to kind of work through things. And I always thought that, you know, I have to make sure everybody really wants to go down this path. They're ready to be, get personal and emotional, but maybe with, with the right prompts, people will just naturally go there. Um, and I think there will be always be some people that they don't want to get emotional with their financial advisor. And that's perfectly fine. There will be plenty of advisors out there that'll crunch numbers, tell you what you need to do. Um, but I, that's not who I want to be. And I take pride, and maybe this comes back to bite me in the future, but I take pride in being willing to construct a plan that is the life plan for you, Matt, that brings you all of the things you want to do, live a great life um, that may not be the most tax efficient. Um, that may not have your 401k maxed out every year because that's what we're supposed to do. But we've constructed the allocations to allow you to take the path that you want. So, you know, don't take this um, at work that Matt doesn't want to work till a long time. But maybe you want to, you know, leave in five years and go, go back to music. Well, your plan to be able to do that is going to look much different than if you want to stay there for another 30 years. You know, asset location all those types of things, how much you're saving in cash, those things all change based off of what you want. Um, and I am not afraid to go against what is conventional to make sure that the plan is right for the individual. So even if it's violating, so I really think this is important how you said this, mm -hmm. get the foundational stuff done, understand how to cover the bait, feed yourself, shelter your family, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. But then from there, beyond that level of, so it, it's, it's kind of like you have to define the enough that satisfies mm -hmm. this first core piece mm -hmm. and then the why that actually satisfies what's beyond that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like goals and visions. It's starting to feel like. Yeah. 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 I did not intentional on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and, and, and truthfully. If I, you know, if I really was to go all in on what I believed, then it would be less about doing that quick plan for traditional retirement. And we would scrap that. It would be making sure you have the right amount of insurance. You have an emergency fund. You don't have a lot of high interest debt. Like if all of those boxes are checked that they're met and where they need to be, then let's skip over society's life and let's just go straight to yours. I, from a compliance standpoint, I feel more comfortable being able to say, look, we made sure that if they worked another 30 years in their career doing what they originally thought they were going to do, they're on a good path. Um, I don't know if your know, regulators would ask about that, but I think that showing the regulators and also showing the client that if you go down this path to create this life and you realize it's not what you want, you can always go back to the path you came from and you're on, you're, you go right back to being on track to retire 30 years from now. Um, but I, I do think it, I still believe it takes a special person that wants to go do that type of planning, I, I think, because it's going to go against a lot of what we've been told we're supposed to do sometimes. And not everybody's comfortable doing that. And when you bring in the fact that it's money, that makes it, that takes it to a whole new level because of the emotions and the fear and money stories and all that type of stuff. Let's talk, let's talk through a few of the things that are the, this is more tactical financial advisor stuff maybe but let's talk through a few of the things that are high on that list of the societal shoulds versus the not necessarily needs to be so if i'm a client and i'm coming to you and we're getting into this why stuff i might say i don't want to own a house mm -hmm. i want to rent mm -hmm. give me give me an example of when like that's that's a good idea and you, absolutely matt that's what you and your family should do 
I mean, if their if their goal was they wanted to be mobile and be able to move around the country, say, hey, we want to, you know, we want to live in Indiana for a while, and we want to go live in California for a while. Like if that's part of their plan, is they want to live in different areas of the country, then I wouldn't say bye. And I'm not even like I'm still not convinced that when you add up all of the expenses, and there's plenty of people who have written about it, that home ownership is all it's cracked up to be. If you get lucky and buy in a hot area, then then maybe over your lifetime it's a better quote unquote investment. But like I'm socking all types of money. Our house is 16 years old. Like it's at the point where we're replacing a lot of things that if I was renting, I wouldn't have to worry about. Um, so I, I think it's personal preference. Same thing like with, with buying and leasing a car. Everybody says you shouldn't lease a car. And I get the reasons why. But if you are the type of person who wants a new car every three years and you're not going to go over the mileage and you're going to get a new car every three years, whether you buy it or lease it, then leasing makes more sense. And if that is your preference, if that's something that you like to do, it makes you happy and you can afford to trade out every three years, then lease a car and get a new car every three years. Like, who am I to say that getting a new car every three years is stupid because a car is just transportation gets you from point A to point B. That's true. But for some people, they're car people. They like that. They like the latest technology. It makes them happy. And you know what? Maybe there's somewhere else in their lifestyle that they're not spending the money that someone else would. Um, so that's why I love Tim Maurer's personal finance is more personal than finance. And so many advisors historically have gone personal finance is more finance than personal. And there's a, a bunch of reasons for that is, you know, the profession really is just getting into true financial planning on a, a large scale. It used to be stockbroker, then it was, you know, still sales. And when financial planning first started, it really was just a sales tactic to, you know, position product, products and things. Now, I think we are getting to where it's really, truly about advice and helping people first. Um, but also, I'm not prepared today to go in depth in this because I haven't given all the thought, but this would be a cool conversation I would love to get your feedback on in the future. I had a, a thought maybe a couple months ago that part of me thinks that the whole financial system is built on a scarcity mindset. And, you know, having our clients have a scarcity mindset because there is a retirement like shortfall for a lot of people in the country, but there are a lot of people, and I'm seeing this with my clients, who have saved appropriately, sacrificed, did things the right way, and have more money than they'll ever spend and enough money to go give to their families. But that's what they were supposed to do. And that was good for the banks. It was good for advisors. And it keeps them in that scarcity mindset of you've got to save, you've got to max out your 401k. And I'm not saying that those aren't important things. But maybe you don't have to max out your 401k based off of what it is that you want to do in life. And having more of that money today and less in the future is a better mix of what you want. Banks, you know, how do they make money? They take our money, save money, you know, make sure you have enough money saved and save as much as you can. And then they go lend that money out and make more money on our money. If we kept less and lived more, that wouldn't be good for certain financial institutions. Um, so like I said, I, it's, it's this thought, I want to spend more time diving down and I don't mean it in a bad way, but even financial advisors have a scarcity mindset. Not every financial advisor is having conversations with the retirees telling them to go spend money. And be, the reason for that is because a lot of us charge AUM. And if we're telling our clients to go spend money and we're doing it across the board, if they can really afford to do it and do it in substantial ways and create these awesome memories, then revenues go down. So we you know, have a a tendency across the profession to not encourage that behavior. Maybe it's conscious, maybe it's subconscious because of the revenue. And I think that if you're the advisor who's doing the right job, running the numbers, helping them live the life they want, encouraging them to go live and spend, you know, not to a point where it causes a problem that yes, you'll see your revenues go down and AUM will drift, but I'm willing to bet that you will get more clients who wants their advice, who want their advisor to help them live that you will grow more than you send out because of this growth of people wanting an advisor actually helping them live and not telling them they can't do it. I feel like I've seen that so many times. I don't, when you were in prior to running your own firm, or you were part of stuff, you mentioned it a minute ago, where like everything was measured. Mm -hmm. You lived in spreadsheet hell at one point, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you ever go through like a strategic planning session where you're looking at the year ahead and you're mapping out revenues and client attrition or asset attrition was one of the factors? This is like our drag on RMDs, expenses, dividends, whatever goes out of 
AUM and billable assets? Have you ever I, I, was, I was never in those meetings. I wasn't important enough. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I wasn't important enough, but I was in those meetings. Mm -hmm. And this is a real consideration in people inside of this industry. It's a really interesting systemic point. I hope you explore that more because, excuse me, the self-reinforced scarcity mindset inside of the financial system is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And it's as real in terms of why the 60-40 is a good investment philosophy mm -hmm. as it is in, yeah, maybe sometimes I could be bastardizing the story. I want to say it's true, but if, if I'm making this up, you know, Justin and Jack, you're my fact checkers wherever <laughs> you are out there. Uh, I'm pretty sure Kitsis, Michael Kitsis, our heralded, you know, Lord and Savior financial planner, I'm pretty sure he for went. He didn't put money into his 401k for a number of years. Does this I don't, sound I still, I, No, I, I don't think that he still does unless maybe I remember him talking about it. He invests in like himself and businesses yeah. he's a part of. So it's not in 401k. It's in other, you know, wealth tech things that he knows will be good for, for the profession. And obviously there's a business in it. I, I know I read or saw either him say that you did too. So we're getting mm -hmm. closer to half of a fact check here at least. Uh, but that's one of those things that I remember seeing the math about clients taking money to spending it and going, that's not bad. Mm -hmm. That's consumption in many cases for good purposes, like go take a vacation or whatever, mm -hmm. spend time with your family. We should be encouraging more of that, even if it's at the detriment of our business, because I feel like if people are happier for putting more joy back in the world by giving permission to do these things, mm -hmm. especially when we've run the models mm -hmm. and you and I are not working with clients typically who the model is like, oh yeah, you're, you're broke in five years. Yep. And, and I'm not saying that we as advisors or our clients should be reckless, but no. like one of my favorite stories is I have a couple that wanted to buy um, one of those sleep sack sofas. They were going to buy a new sofa and let's just say they were going to spend like four grand on a new sofa and the sleep sack was like seven. And I was like, you have more money than you're ever going to spend. Go buy the sleep sack. Like you, yes, it's three thousand dollars more, but you're already spending four. So why not spend a little bit more for the thing that you actually want? So you know, six months roll around, they come back in for our semi-annual review, and I ask them about the couch and say, "Oh, we love it. Like we're going to." They had it on their their patio during the spring and summer. We're going to bring that into the the living room in the winter, so we have it all year round, and then we're going to buy another one for the patio. And it seems silly, like, does a couch really make that much difference in someone's life? They said they enjoyed their patio even more than they had before because they had this nice, comfortable couch. So that extra $3,000, they will never notice. It's not going to cause any difference in their life, but it was them stepping out and buying a luxury. And then once they did it once, they realized they weren't going to go broke and they gave themselves the permission next time. We didn't even talk about it. They told me they're buying that next sleep sack couch. It wasn't <laughs> like we had to talk about it. So. You know, and I always tell people when I start having these conversations with them, I say, look, the reason you're in this position is because you live below your means, you saved, invested, did all the right things for 30 years. To ask you to change that behavior overnight is not realistic. Like, I understand that it's a behavior that you practice for 30 years, and I'm telling you to do the opposite of it now, go spend. And then so it's just little things like that to give people the, the ability to see that, okay, I can take from my portfolio and it's going to go down, but in a couple of years, it's replenished itself, if not sooner. And Especially, that's why you do reviews. That's why you don't just meet once a year and like never look at things. You continue to watch the numbers. You continue to look at Monte Carlo. You know, that's the best we can do is forecasting what might happen just to give us some direction. And if everything continues to look strong, then there's no reason to make any changes. And you know, I tell them like, Hey, maybe we, maybe one year we won't be able to do this because something changes and we see something we never have seen. We just have to be able to, to pull back if we need to. But for now, everything we know as of today, go ahead and do it. Really big question. I know a bunch of people are wanting me to ask somewhere, yelling at their phones and computer screens. Does your family think you're crazy for looking at all these things and investing into experiential or personal values with all this stuff? They haven't told me. I'm I think my wife sometimes thinks I'm crazy as I come up with ideas. Like I have business ideas all the time that now, like I just joke about. In the past, I would like seriously think about it. But as far as like the experience in those things, no, because they get like the experiences I want are with them. 
So they are a you know beneficiary of of this thought process. They also know that you know I've run our financial plan. And I know that where we are and with what we have saved and what we keep on saving, that we're in good shape to be able to shift more towards you know having these experiences or putting money in places that you know maybe there's not any return on investment. Like I. I don't have a goal of making a certain number of dollars in a year, but I do have a, a goal. This is probably more goal than it is vision, um, which is shameful. It should be vision, but there's still like money stories that mm-hmm. I want to make enough money to where I can just you know give frivolously, whether that is helping somebody out in need or investing in a friend's business, or let's say you come out with a merch line, I'm buying hoodies and not even think twice about it. Um, yeah. Like that's part of my long-term plan is to get to a situation where I can spend money with no expectation of any return on investment just because I want to support people because I know what it's like to start things in the past and have people support or have people not support. And I want to be able to be other people's biggest cheerleaders, support them financially, support them vocally and do what I can to to help them um, stay in the game with whatever they're doing. So that, I mean, I, but I've shared that with my family. I said, that's one of my goals. I want to, you know, there's one thing I, I regret do, not doing, and I think we could have swung it. But a few years ago, there was a kid that was in the soccer program that Leo's in. And it wasn't on the team. I have no idea who it was. But the mom lived further away, and she has five kids, and, like, their van broke down. So she asked for help getting the kids to soccer practice. And I had the conversation with Ange. What if we just bought her a used car? Bought a car, hand her the keys, and give her some reliable transportation. It would probably cost us, I don't know, $15,000 or so, maybe a little bit less, maybe more, to get one that isn't like brand new, but will not give her problems. And I, di- I didn't do it. Looking back, I think financially we, we could have swung it, but I want to be in a position where I don't think twice. Yeah. Like to me, and, and I also want to do it on the down low. Like I think there's times to virtue signal and put it out there to inspire people, but to, like, to do things like that, I would love to do that. And you know, she knows and no one else knows. You've done small versions of this. Yeah. You're, you're the guy who buys the cup of coffee for the person after you or something. Yep. I know you are. Correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also know you're the guy who, you know, sends me this sweatshirt because, you know, we did something together and whatever else. And it's uh, your, your awareness. I guess I want to tie this back to having that vision that's bigger than the goal for the community of people you're keeping around you. Mm-hmm. That's like, that's an emotional asset for you and your family that you're very conscientiously building, even though it's not, there's no ROI on that. There's no mm-hmm. direct conversion back. Mm-hmm. Is that, that's a fair way to say you think or approach this. Yeah. I mean, if you took the spreadsheet, you'd be like, Justin, you waste a lot of money. <laughs> like, because, you know, like buying sweatshirts and buying these cups to give away to my, you know, podcast guests. There's no real return on investment on that, but it's a nice gesture and I get happiness and enjoyment out of doing things for people to try to make them feel good. So I don't need that, that, that dollar or that investment to have any ROI or be worth anything financially because it's worth so much to me emotionally and spiritually. And I think there's a place for that in the financial plan. Now, Again, going back to the basics, you got to make sure the basics are there. Don't be like, I would not be doing those types of things if we were living paycheck to paycheck or just enough to get by. Uh, But that, again, is part of my motivation for why I work the way I work and do the things I do is because I believe, and this is part of the vision, that all of the hard work I'm doing today is going to result in my income going up in the future. So I can do more and more of these cool things and do them in a bigger way and you'll selfishly be able to take cooler trips and things like that. But, you know, a lot of my motivation from this point going forward, which is a part of my plan, is to impact other people. Again, depending on your beliefs, that may be a stupid use of dollars. Why would you work hard to make more money to not benefit from it for yourself financially? I'm I'm not motivated by money that way. And that shows up in my plan. And I know that about myself. So that goes back to like the life design and life planning is I want to help people figure those things out 
for themselves. You don't have to match me. You probably shouldn't because that may not be you. But whatever it is that makes you happy and aligns with who you are and what you want to accomplish and what you want to leave behind in the world, that stuff needs to show up in your plan and we need to plan for it. So, you know, if I were my financial advisor and I shared these goals with, with myself, I would say, hey, like, that's an awesome goal. You need to go make more money to make that happen. Otherwise, you may have to sacrifice other areas to be able to do more of this charitable work. Don't know where it is. This is for you to take outside of this conversation. But that whole scarcity mindset, I think you just are, you're on the edge of explaining why you can build an ecosystem of an abundance mindset inside of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is the ultimate like unbanking of this idea. And I want to be away from emotional debts or all those things of this analogy. So maybe drop banks altogether. But that abundance, abundance comes from communities. Abundance comes from network effects. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from overdraft fees and loans or, you know, getting stressed out over this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you could do that once you have the basics covered. Right. And I hope that that could be motivation for people to go get the basics, like taken care of quickly. Right. Like, okay, if, if you want the freedom to build your plan the way you want it to be, then you got to get these basics done. You got to get the foundation in so that if there is any pivots or change or, or life throws a curveball at you, you're not in a bad shape. You're not in bad shape because we skipped over the important things. Like I have this um, Carl Richards NFT. You can't see. I'm not going to move my camera because it messed things up, but it's, it's the interlocking circles he's done. And on one side, it says people you love. On the other one, it says experiences. And the overlap is spend the money. Um, and I like to say that I am the first person to buy a Carl Richards NFT. I don't think anybody bought any of his NFTs before that. And I have the first of nine. But I intentionally have it on the wall behind where I sit with my clients. And my clients see it and they commented on it. But I want my retirees to see that and have the confidence to spend the money on the things for the people they love. But I want my younger clients who may not be that in that point of being able to do that quite yet to be motivated by that picture to say, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to spend whatever I want to spend on the people that I love with doing whatever I want to do and not have to think twice about it. So I love having it right there as just a reminder for people and just subliminally getting them thinking about it. I want to go through a couple of categories of these things with you and just sort of reorganize some of these thoughts around this because I'm mm -hmm. so interested in the way you're structuring all this for yourself and your family and for clients. So just looking at you, just looking at your wife's portfolio, the way mm -hmm. you're life design plusing this thing, mm -hmm. you and your wife both have your, your human capital, the work that you do. Mm -hmm. So you do something, it's exchange for money coming in, and you've both kind of conscientiously settled into paths that produce what they, you need them to produce for income to support the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like both of you were probably really conscientious of this is how much we need to do this. And you're setting a really good boundary on not trying to go way too far with either of that. Neither of you are trying to be the Amazon of either of your things, right? Not at this moment, no. And how do you think of or would you explain that boundary just because you have the, the planner hat? And you can mm -hmm. say, this is enough for this, so it's okay to draw a boundary here? I think the, the beginning of the boundary starts with my time. Time for my family, time for me to do the things that I want to do. Because there was once a period in my career where I was doing way too much, and I didn't have time for me. And the time I had for my family, I lied to myself and was pretending to be present when I really wasn't. So for me, it starts with, does this lifestyle, does this work balance allow me the time that I want to never miss the boys' games, to have the time to create and do the writing and the podcasting and the things that I love so much. And if that allows me to do that, then I don't need to grow. Um, but if there is anything that ever changes, I, you know, the desire to make more money, to give more money away. Okay, how, how much more do I need to work to be able to get to that next level? And what does that do with my time? And then I have to have a conversation with myself first and then with the family if it was a big change in you know work if i had to work a lot more to make this happen you know i have to be okay with that first and then i have to run that by my family to make sure they're on board with it but my big gauge is am i able to do what i want when i want to do within reason and us still maintain our lifestyle and if so then that's fine cuz truthfully what i think will happen is 
I'll be more motivated to run it up in the future when the boys are older. Mm. When you don't have to be at right. soccer practice or yeah, basketball I mean, camp or whatever thing. Yeah. Because like our evenings, we're running around like most parents are to practices, getting dinner in, art classes, you know, picking up the house. Like there's all of that. And even just like the mental time that I dedicate to the family, thinking about the boys and what we need to do and how can I help them. Like when all of that has, you know, is not as much as it is today and I have more time, you know, then I can run it up and, and make a lot more money if I want to or whatever it might be. Whatever it might be. So right now, and you don't have to give me exact details on this. I'm just curious, but mm -hmm. the excesses in finance are basically probably saving for a retirement, saving for kids education making sure the emergency fund is full and then the rest of it's just going to other endeavors. Yeah. What I'm trying to reinvest a lot right now is in like my, my rebrand, if you will, mm -hmm. and life design plus and pouring into that. Um, because I've done content for a period of time and put no money into it and had success. Like RLS wealth grew because of my content creation. Um, but to get and have the impact that I want to have around life design plus and the authentic life, I know I need to invest. So I have a, a company that I'm working with to help with brand building strategy. Like I never had strategy before. So having a strategy, um, I have a videographer that comes in once a month and we shoot videos and I'm having editors edit my podcast more and create shorts. So I'm like really investing more in that right now. Um, and even have scaled back some of the retirement savings, if I'm being honest and transparent. Um, it's, I'm not saving none, but I'm not saving as much as I once was, uh, because of where we're at, we, you know, Angie and I were very fortunate. We both did really well out of college. We caught a good bull market. Like we invested well. So I'm at a point now, and this is something I talk to younger people about is, uh, because of our behaviors, younger ages, we put ourselves in a position that middle of life, we could scale back savings. We could scale back earnings. And, and do more of what it is we want to do at this phase of life. And I'm so glad because it allows me to do these things with the boys. So we have a good, you know, a good nest egg saved. I can do the rule of 72 and, you know, run my financial planning software and see that we're in good shape. Um, yeah, it'd be cool to have a lot more, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather do the things I'm doing now. And truthfully, I would rather invest more in my future as this life planner and content creator and financial advisor than put more money into my 401k because I don't need to um, at this point. Now, markets do something crazy, then maybe I have to go back to putting more into it. But as long as market averages do what they do, then I have the ability to invest in me, which is really cool because now I'm doing a lot of cool things that I've never done before. And I'm already seeing the benefits of that, that work. I think it's interesting that this point of the trade-off of labor is really this trade-off of time. The excess in the financial capital that generates for you right now is a lot of it's going into intellectual property mm -hmm. and building out these things that, like you just said, in RLS Wealth, the generation of the content actually translated to growth in that business. Mm -hmm. And this is where thinking outside the box, I think, can be beneficial. Like, hmm. so foregoing maxing out my 401k and investing more in my intellectual property and my brand and the podcast, like the vision says that that is going to pay off more than the stock market could return in a period of time when things, you know, go the direction that I believe they're going to go. But I can show, I can, I have a real life example of that is when I launched RLS Wealth, I took a $10,000 principal distribution from my Roth IRA to get started. And what that $10,000 investment has turned into from a standpoint of, you know, the income that I earn, the value of my business, which I'll never sell my business. Um, I would much rather dissolve my business and get and walk away. So this goes back to the, do the dollar thing. I would not want to sell my business for a multiple. There's something about putting a value on the relationships that I've built over the last 15 years that makes my skin crawl. So I would love to be in a position that my succession plan would be that I retire and I find an advisor or advisors that I can introduce my clients to and receive nothing for it and say, hey, you know, I'm at a stage where I am 
going on to the next phase of my life. I've thought long and hard about this. This is the advisor I would encourage you to continue working with. I have no skin in the game. Um, and be in a position that I'm financially where I don't need to sell my business. And I know that sounds crazy and maybe things will change as I get older. Um, but I, that's part of my plan is to be in a position to where I can, I can pass my clients off financial transaction free because I don't need it. And that would allow me to sleep well at night. Um, now I have thought of a scenario where uh, part of the succession plan is I stay on for like 18 months and I get paid a salary. So that sal I am compensated somewhat for the book of business, but uh, it's actually my, I'm there working still. So I'm a W2 employer, 1099 employee of that other firm to make the transition smooth. And then after that period of time, I walk away and, and get nothing more. That to me is a situation I would love to be in in the future because then I could feel like I'm truly putting the client way ahead of myself. And let's be honest, socially in that the social capital required to do that means the belief in you from the clients, mm -hmm. the belief in you for whoever is stepping into this business. And if it's 18 months or not 18 years, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I've worked with some people who have said things like I'll be around for 18 months, then have still been around in 18 yep. months. I know this story. The clients have to believe it. The person taking over has to believe it. Your family has to believe it. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that time boundary. Mm -hmm. If you don't invest in the relationships, you never get to that point, which mm -hmm. makes so much of the time investment in all these people that can never be part of the vision unless you're investing in that today. Mm -hmm. Do you see it that way as well? Yeah. And I know that was a tangent, but going back to kind of like the non-traditional non planning yeah. is that I think that invest at this point and what I need for my, my personal long-term plan investing in myself and my intellectual property and what it is that I'm building um, will be a good investment financially long-term. Whether that is, I do build something that could be sold in the future or the, the income derived from the non-advisor stuff that I'll do in the future, you know, is, is what it needs to be for me to live a good life in the future. So, and the thing is, I, I, everything I'm investing in, I love, which I think is a good recipe as well. That's not a bad recipe. Last, last capital oriented question. Your kids, mm -hmm. you've got a special relationship with your dad. Your dad, I'm really hoping is going to leave a comment below this video somewhere on YouTube. He will. He will. <laughs> I, I hope my heart is already banking on it. So not to put undue pressure on him, but I love your dad's comments on YouTube. They're one of my favorite parts of YouTube in general. <laughs> he passed generational wisdom to you and setting the example. That car example is going to be that's going to be with me for a minute. Second crazy dad car story I've heard today. That's, that's <laughs> an offline conversation. Um, you, you, you got some kids running around. What, mm -hmm. what generational wisdom does this, you might be saying, Hey, there's not a financial asset coming to you from dad's business. Unless one of them decides they want to take it over. Mm -hmm. I mean, Silas is clearly going to come join me mm -hmm. because you know, the family's practically abandoned him. All he got was a letter S <laughs> one's got their whole names. So I'm already poaching him, but. What do you want them to know? Generational wisdom. What, what gets passed to them? How is this leading by example to them? The generational wisdom I want them to understand is the, it's the spirit, mind, body, and authentic life. Like I want them to discover that before they turn 38, 39, which is when mm -hmm. I figured it out. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't change anything about my, my, my path because all of that led me. But if I, I would have loved to have figured it out sooner. So if I can plant those seeds and help them find their passions in life and have the confidence to follow them, whatever way that looks and whatever magnitude that is to live a good life and, and do what they are meant to be doing, I think finances take care of themselves. I do want to leave them money. I'm not going to lie. Like I don't, I don't have the Warren Buffett goal of leaving them next to nothing relative to what I have. I'm not going to be able to leave them. But even, even though he's Buffett's leaving them nothing, he's still leaving them a lot. I don't. Right. I don't want to, I don't want to leave them nothing. Like I want to work hard and be able to give them enough money that they can go pursue what it is they want to in their thirties or forties or whenever they figure it out without worrying about finances. So I want them to be smart enough when it comes to finances to manage it properly. But then I would love to leave them a nest egg that allowed them 
to go full time into content creation or full time into um, computer development or whatever it might be. Because that's, I mean, really, that's what, like, to me, that's money. Money ends up being freedom. Like, it's a tool, but for, for me, money buys freedom. And I would be lying if I said that if I had enough money to where I could do my succession plan and do my 18 months and, and retire early to go create content full time and spread this word of the authentic life and spirit, mind, and body, I'd be lying if I wouldn't seriously think about it if I had the money. But I don't have it. So I keep on doing both because I love doing both. I want them to have the freedom to pursue the thing that they know they're supposed to do without worrying about money. Because I think that they may use some of that money to get going. And then once they find their groove, then I think your authentic life brings you all of the finances you need. It may not make you the richest person in the world, but it brings you what you need to live the life that you want comfortably. Kind of that. $10,000 Roth distribution that yeah. you took. You self-funded yourself. What's the equivalent? Push that snowball at the top of the mountain so it can start rolling for them. Mm -hmm. I, don't know what that, I don't know what that number will be for them, but um, I do want to make, I do have a financial goal of leaving them some. You better hope they don't Monte Carlo it out to be $10 million. <laughs> find out dad's got a $10 million check or else <laughs> your days are numbered. <laughs> I want to try to summarize some of this stuff. You said so many things in this conversation and, uh, you know, you talk to me, you get notes. So this is the way this goes. At the beginning, and I really, I hope that you write or think more about this in the future, because I think your way of explaining goals and visions is, is actually kind of a profound way to look at this thing. Mm -hmm. Because this idea of what can be, what can be qualitative and what can be quantitative and the layers inside of each is really powerful because that sets up this idea of. I can write myself this $10 million check. I can't cash it today. Mm -hmm. I'm also not just canonizing it in the Ricky Henderson sense. I'm Jim mm -hmm. carrying this check in my wallet. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's poetry for you right there. Um, but that differentiator between I've got my goals, here's the qualitative and the quantitative version of them. I've got my vision, here's the qualitative and the quantitative version of it. And that's like that first guiding principle. Once you get that early stage done, you can dive into all this other stuff you're doing because you said it, the numbers in the spreadsheets have to align with why. Mm -hmm. It's so much further than the consume or gift thing that we're, we're so in tune with in this business and what we're doing in the financial, financial planning. The goal of getting your basics done, but the vision of getting your why done. You told us about the Kinder Registered Life Planner Program. I'm mm -hmm. ecstatic to learn more from you about that down the road. You talked about the, I'm, I made the note to myself, the societal values versus the personal values. You went through the list of the okay or not okay of, do you want to own the house? You want to rent the house? Do you want to buy the car? You want to lease the car? You want to fund the 401k? You want to skip doing it? So many of those thoughts are tied to this system with a scarcity mindset in it. Mm -hmm. And we're full of, this is an industry of financial advisors, full of people not necessarily saying, go out and spend that money, reduce my compensation, go buy the couch. It's not going to break your budget. You have permission so that you can match up the goal of your lifestyle com consumption against the vision of your lifestyle happiness. Mm -hmm. That's mic drop stuff right there from you. No return on investment investments. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably brand that, brand that, you know, put it on a coffee mug or something. Yeah. <laughs> I made a note to myself. Do you remember the Omi song, the cheerleader song from a few years ago? No. I think this is the opposite, not the opposite. This is like a tangent of angel investing is cheerleader investing. Mm -hmm. And that was what I thought of when you're talking about wanting to buy the reliable used car or just fund the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the cheerleader moment for what somebody else is trying to get going. Mm -hmm. And that's not expecting any return. That's just, this makes m my world a better place. Another example of that real quick, Please. and I think we've talked about it before. So the vision I have for Pursuit and like the record label, my vision for the record label, it'll be a hip hop record label, probably exclusively. But the goal is to find up and coming people that I identify that have talent. I think I have an eye for talent across different business lines and different things and help them put out their first album. And while that first album is being you know, created, teach them the way to set up their own independent label. So Pursuit Records, you only get one album. 
and albums two through infinity are on your own independent record label that we have nothing to do with. So it's, I don't want to create a record label to compete with, you know, Def Jam or whoever, you know, whatever big record labels are out there. Um, I want to create it because I love hip hop and I've never been able to experience it at that level. And that would be really, really cool. And I think I could help people. And I want to be in a position again where I don't need that record label to pay for my lifestyle. I want to help somebody who's talented who would not have the opportunity to go start their, their own record label and start their, their music career without somebody helping them. I want to be able to help put people on. Um, so that's another, you know, technically there'd be no ROI on that. Hopefully within all of that, there's enough to cover the expenses of the business. But then beyond that, it's about getting people in control of their destiny. I love that because inside of it, and I feel this is a conversation in my household a lot too. You give time into these situations. You say, I've got the financial capital to do this. I'm, I'm going to connect these through the capitals that you said too, because it's when you were talking about your human capital and you and your wife and your job and how you trade that for work, time as the boundary. Mm -hmm. Man, you can do a whole episode or write a whole book or just spend all day every day talking to clients about this and talking to your spouses about this and talking to yourself about it. Time as the boundary that says financial capital beyond this point of savings we need for our basic financial plan becomes time I can spend in other things mm -hmm. into for you, into the IP, into if you're going to do this record label project. The funny stuff is you could spend money putting it on this. You have one artist who's a hit and then turns around and says, Justin, I need my financial plan done. Right. And it's like you can tip the scale on all these things by writing these lottery tickets where you're betting on people. And that ties into the social aspect. Like you explained beautifully with the succession plan for RLS wealth, maybe someday of the family part of it, the partnership part of it, the client part of it. It all requires a network to play out to give you the right value. And then that's the network that you surround your family with. That's the generational wisdom. You're going to kids, you got to go out and find your own group of people around you. Mm -hmm. But look at the way that I did this. Look at the way this provided for us. Here's your nudge to go find those people. You just, you said something that made me think about something else of the generational education and kind of like legacy type stuff that for a long time I didn't appreciate, but I appreciate more so now as I have been lucky to build a ridiculous network of people. And I know you have, because I ask you to tap it for me on more on regular, <laughs> regular basis. It is really, really cool. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of being able to introduce my boys to some of those people. So for example, one of the guys who's been on my podcast, Justin Ochoa, is a basketball trainer here in town. Trains guys who play overseas, trains some of the you know top WNBA players, and he's a friend of mine, and he trains Roman. Two days a week, nothing crazy, but it's cool that I have this relationship with Justin that I allow, that I can bring to my boys. Or Tyrone Ross, who's an amazing human being, that I can have my boys, like my boys can talk to him and they can learn from him and his experiences. So I think that another really cool thing that we as parents have an opportunity to do is, yes, there's the financial things we can pass on and there's the, the lessons we can pass on, but I think being able to build a network that can help our kids and not necessarily help them get ahead per se, maybe that's part of it, but like to give them access to extremely bright people that they would have no other access to is, is a really, really cool. And I think valuable gift outside of the system. Again, mm -hmm. that, that's a teacher. You don't luck into that. You might luck into that teacher in school. Mm -hmm. That teacher isn't directed at you unless you either have the finances or other some sort of resources to do that. Mm -hmm. You've invested in your social capital and the social network in a way that you can put that opportunity in front of your kids, which is A, a hell of a dad flex. B, that's part of their educational upbringing inside of this system. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you mentioned networking. That popped in my head. That's why we do these summaries. I know I'm going to knock a few little things loose going through this. Plug, plug all the stuff. JustinCostelli.io, I think, is the website where you can yep. find everything uh, on YouTube. If you just search the name Justin Costelli, you can find, subscribe, follow Justin's channel. I know you've got all the podcasts out there, too. What else do you want to plug? Life Design Plus, et cetera. 
that, that would be it. JustinCostello.io has it all. I just recently redid the website so that it speaks to who I am today and where it is that I'm going. And uh, yeah, that'd be it. And I just, I want to thank you for this opportunity because I said things today that I've never said out loud before. Um, I probably thought of them, maybe I've written them down before, but it's really cool to have this conversation with you and have these ideas come out because now that they're out, I'll be able to think more about them. And, and to your point, some of these things, the, the vision versus goals, I've never thought about breaking that down. And truthfully, I've never had to describe the difference because until today, because you asked. So um, like this was a really cool conversation, which I'm lucky we have these things regularly, not on camera, um, but it was really, really, I hope it was valuable for other people, but if not, it was valuable for me um, because it's, it's helped me get some more ideas out there and get more clear on some things and also give me some direction of some avenues to pursue as well. I love this so much. I'm so grateful you did this. Justin Costelli, you're a truly an intentional investor. And I just want to encourage people, if, if you're looking for an advisor that can really help you figure out who you are and that your life plan, your life's worth and your life vision is okay. So who you are is okay. What you want that vision to be is okay. And then how all those things, the plan, the work, the vision can all align to be okay. Justin's your guy. Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.